It's a little warm in here. The air conditioner has been working on and off this week. It's currently off, right? But I'm wearing way more clothes than anybody, so I'll be the canary in the coal mine, okay? If you see me faint, you can panic. Otherwise, just calm down. <clears throat> so the second reading today is St. Paul's letter to St. Timothy. How many have heard of St. Timothy? Is that it? <laughs> Come on, where are we? We're St. Timothy's, that's right, okay. So St. Timothy, this young bishop, a disciple of the Lord, but a disciple of Paul, Paul is his spiritual father. And he writes to him and he, he reminds him of the mission, Timothy's mission and his mission in the church and he, he reminds him, your spiritual father, the one who directs you, the one who uh, prays for you, uh, the one who uh, teaches you of the Lord, I used to be a bad man, but the Lord saved me. He said, the Lord came to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. And this is not Paul just exaggerating. This is Paul practicing what is the right practice for our relationship with God. And that is, when it comes to me and God and the world, who's the sinner in my mind? Me. Once I start saying, well, I'm a sinner, but you know, those people, they, they sin too. I've lost it. I've lost my perspective. Your sin is God's business, right? And so my sin is my business, and so I am the sinner. You remember in, in the temple when you have the, 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 the Pharisee who's up front and saying, oh, look at all the things I've done for you, Lord. Jesus tells this parable. And then you have the publican in the back, right? And he's saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's not what it says. It says, have mercy on me, the sinner. Because when we come before the Lord, it's my sin that I'm concerned about. And so St. Paul's message to St. Timothy is basically this. Look, I was bad. I was the worst. But the Lord saved me. He came to me. And he says, if I can be saved, this is a summary of Paul's argument. If I can be saved, anybody can be saved. So preach the gospel. Now, that's the second reading. In the first reading, we look... Moses is speaking to God and he reminds God of his promise to Abraham because God swore an oath to Abraham. You will be the father of many nations. You will have many descendants and I will be your God. And now Abraham's descendants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob becomes Israel, Israel goes to Egypt. They're there for a long time. They come out of Egypt and what are they doing? They swear an oath, yes, we will be faithful to the Lord and then they start worshiping a golden calf. Blatant idolatry, blatant betrayal of God, and the oath they swore to God. And so God says to Moses, hey, let me start over with you. And Moses, he says, no way, <laughs> right? You promised to Abraham. He said, so let's keep this. So what happens is, is Israel is in idolatry, the worst of the sins, blatant idolatry, and they're unrepentant. And Moses intercedes on their behalf, even though they're not repenting. And God listens to Moses. Now we get to Psalm 51, and David is singing his great confession, his great repentance. Why? Because not only did he fall into adultery and murder, but he brought other people in to collude with him in his sins. And then the prophet uh, Nathan, Nathaniel, comes to him and, and says, uh, hey, I got a story for you. And he tells him a story about a man with a little sheep and a king who had a whole flock, and the king killed the, little, the man's little sheep. And David gets mad and says, hey, that guy should be killed, right? And Nathan said, that man is you. He told Nathan, he told David a story so that David could take a good look at himself. And David's response is repentance. Israel didn't repent, so Moses did it for them. David is convicted and he repents. 
Now in the gospel, the scribes and the Pharisees are criticizing Jesus. They're telling Jesus, you're hanging around with the wrong people. You are eating and drinking. In other words, you're celebrating with these people who are sinners, right? They're the problem. And why are you there with them? They're unclean. And so Jesus tells them a story. And he tells them this story because they're claiming to be faithful to Moses. But Moses pled the part of Israel. And this particular group of scribes and Pharisees, we should say, not all the scribes and the Pharisees agreed, right? They disagreed on things. But this group of scribes and Pharisees wanted Jesus to cut the sinners loose. They were nothing like Moses, even though they claimed to be faithful to his law. They had forgotten that the king that they wanted restored, the king they praised as King David. When I went to Israel, we had a chance to go to the tomb of, of David on, on the Sabbath. And we went in there and there's, right, there's Jewish men singing and dancing around the tomb of David, still today. He's celebrated as the king of Israel. But this particular group of scribes and Pharisees had forgotten that he was a sinner in need of God's mercy and that he repented. So Jesus, who is hanging around with the wrong people, right? He's eating and drinking with them because they're repenting. They're coming to him. And he says, I will continue to associate with them. He shows them a picture of himself by telling a story. Now, we know the story of the father and the son, the prodigal son, the younger son, but really what he wants to show them is the older brother. And he says, the older brother is you. So let me tell you about the older brother, he says. You know, we know the younger son. He wanted his father's inheritance. He left. He did whatever he wanted. He ended up in trouble. And then he came to his senses and he came back to his father to confess his sin and to repent. He had a change of heart. The older brother never left. He stayed home. He was always obedient. He worked hard. He was faithful to his father. He was always not in trouble. Or he was never in trouble. But he and his brother had one thing in common that was an unfortunate mistake. And that is they both believed that they had to earn their father's favor. They had to earn it. They had to earn his love. And so the younger son, or the older son, believes that his father owes him the favor because he's always been faithful, right? There's an irresponsible little brother. He comes home. He comes back to the father's embrace, and the older son is angry, Jesus says. Angry with jealousy. Angry with envy. Why? I never got a party. I never got food, right? All we got was hot dogs. You kill the fattened calf for your friend here. Right? When I was in uh, Lake Havasu City, one of my good friends, Father Tony, a uh, Nigerian priest, uh, and he, he says, you know, he says, things have been great these last years. When I, when I go home this year, I'm going to buy a cow. We're going to kill it and we're going to eat it in the whole village. Like that was his idea of celebration, right? So it's still, a, so we have this celebration. And the older son, he's out working. And he comes back, and everybody's partying, everybody's dancing, there's music, there's food, and he gets jealous. He's angry. And so the father comes out to him. Hey, come on in. Your, your son, or your, your little brother is back. He's like, yeah, pfft, that guy. <laughs> Forget him. He ran off. I'm your good son. And the father comes out to him. And he says, son, you're always with me. All I have is yours. That's an amazing statement. All that I have is yours. He never lacked for anything. But he won't go in. He won't even go in and join the party. 
And Jesus holds this story up to the scribes and the Pharisees in front of him and says, that older brother is you. What's the difference between the younger brother and the older brother? See, we focus on the younger brother went out and did bad stuff, and the older brother did all the good stuff. That's what they focused on. That is not what the father focused on. What did the father focus on? Both of them are his son. And why did he throw the party? Because the younger son had a changed heart. The older son needed a changed heart, but did he have one? No. His opinion of himself kept him from receiving the grace of conversion. He thought he was good enough, or at least he thought he was better. And so Moses pleads the cause of Israel. David repents with his whole heart. He's a man after God's own heart because he repented a changed heart. Paul speaks to Timothy, I have a changed heart. And now the Lord says, look at this son with the changed heart. And the Lord says, that's what I want of you, a changed heart. Where you've been, what you've done, just come back. Just come home. I will give you the grace to have a changed heart. In the first part of the gospel, there's the shepherd, right? And Jesus says, which one of you shepherds, if you lost one sheep, wouldn't leave your other 99 in the desert and go out and get the one? And what do you think the shepherd said? Me, I wouldn't go out there. I got one lost sheep, I got 99 right here. Why would I leave them in the desert and go get the one? That's the point of Jesus' story. See how unlike God you are. See how much your heart needs to be changed to be like his. Moses knew that. David knew that. And so this 99, you know, when I was growing up, there was a picture in our hallway of Jesus, and he's carrying a sheep on his shoulders. I love that. I remember looking up at it. I must have been like five. So I'm looking up at this picture of Jesus carrying the sheep. And every time I got into trouble, oh boy, every time I got into trouble, I'd be like, Jesus, save me. I'd go look at the picture in the hallway. I'm in trouble. And he had that. He would carry the sheep and Jesus was smiling and the sheep was smiling and there were a bunch of sheep around him, right? And they were walking through the grassy field. That's what I always picture. That's this one. But the 99 sheep, at least in the picture in our hallway, the other sheep weren't jealous. They weren't angry. They were glad. Why would they be glad if the shepherd went out and chased after the one and left them alone in the desert? I always wondered that. This is what I think anyway. You can tell me what you think. I think it would be this, that the 99 would be glad because all of them would know in their heart if that were me, he would have come for me too. And therefore, it's true I never left, but let me be glad and rejoice. The father just wanted his older son to come in and join the party. All that I have is yours, he said. All that I have is yours. And so, you know, we look at each other, we see each other differently. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we see ourselves differently. I'm not as good as those people, right? But the Lord doesn't do that. He looks at you and he loves you. I'll end with this last little story. When I was in a previous parish, I was talking to a group of uh, grandmothers, really. They had, uh, there was about four or five of them. They all had grown children who had children. And they were talking, somehow they got onto the topic of how they love their children. And one of them said, I love all my children the same. And one lady said, I don't. <laughs> what? You don't, you don't love all your children the same? She says, no, why would I? So one of the gals, a little spunky, right? She says, all right, which one do you love the most? Right? Put her on the spot. She said, whichever one needs it the most at that time. Well, then all of a sudden it made sense, right? So God will sometimes love one person more than another. I don't care. Because when I need it, God loves me more than I know. And when you need it, God loves you more than you know.
I don't want God to be fair. I would rather have a loving and generous God who is so generous I can't even contain all he wants to give, who is so loving that I, I can't even comprehend or hold all the love that he gives. Why would I want him to be fair? That would be a downgrade. God is not fair. He's loving. He's generous. And he's the God who seeks after you and who calls you, whether you're at home or whether you're away. Let me change your heart. You know, growing up there was a little prayer. Maybe you know it. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto thine. Do you know that one? Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto thine. Amen.